Good morning. Now that Ron and Bertha are here, we can start. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for taking your time to spend one hour with us. We pray that this will be a good investment of your time. Uh, works both ways, I think. We prepare for you and you prepare for us. So um, if you have a bulletin, there is an incredible amount of things taking place in spite of the COVID-19 yeah, activity. So please take note at all of those. Um, what, a couple of things I'd like to bring out to you. The, uh, you have the election uh, sheet back there for you to uh, select people that you want to take responsibilities by taking an office. And uh, please put it in the offering box back there as well. That's where the tithes and offerings go. And uh, please look after that. And of course, Operation Christmas Child is going as well. So please take note of that. Uh, that would be an, a very rewarding thing to see. And it'd be interesting to, uh, if, they, if they had little tagging mechanisms, I suppose, to find out where your box ended up at, wouldn't it? That would be phenomenal. Uh, someday I'm sure we'll do that and so they'll show you who it is up on the screen probably, but that would be phenomenal, that would be great. But we know it's gonna end up in great hands and do a great deal of grace and enjoyment to the people that receive it. I was watching, um, uh, college football this weekend and uh, what intrigues me the most is not so much the teams that are winning um, the teams that are against the underdogs and those are the ones I like to watch and so this was a couple of uh, universities going at each other one was six and zero with the record and the other one's one and five so obviously I'm rooting for that one and five and so they were going really well and at the halftime the underdog was beating the winning team by 20 points, 20 points at the half. So they went to their little huddle and whatever, they came back and of course the, uh, the press is right there. So coach, what did you tell your team? I mean, you're behind 20 points, what did you tell them? And you look straight at the camera, I didn't look at the reporter, he looked straight at the camera and said, I reminded them of the basics. We are not doing the basics. So it reminds me of an old story about a lady who lived alone and wanted a pet, went to the pet store to buy a talking parrot. She thought the bird might fill some of her lonely hours. The very next day, however, she came back to, the, to complain, a parrot doesn't talk. Well, the store owner asked if he had a mirror in the cage. No, there's no mirror in the cage. Oh, parrots love mirrors, he explained. When he sees his reflection in the mirror, He'll just start talking away. So he sold her a birdcage mirror. Bird owner was back the next day to gripe that her parrot still hadn't said a word. Well, that's very peculiar, allowed the pet expert. How about a swing? Birds really love those little swings. And a happy parrot is a talking parrot. So the woman bought a swing, took it home, and installed it in the cage. She was back the next day. Same story. Does he have a ladder to climb, the salesman asked. That's just have to be the problem. Once he has a ladder, he'll probably talk you a year off. So the lady bought a ladder. The woman was back at the pet store when it opened the next day. From the look on her face, the owner knew something was very wrong. Didn't your parrot like the ladder? He asked. His repeat customer looked up and said, the parrot died. The parrot died, he said. I'm so sorry, the stunned businessman said. Did he ever say anything? Well, yes, she finally, he, yes, he finally talked just before he died. In a weak little voice, he asked me, don't they sell any bird seed at that pet store? <laughs> the basics basics. The writer of Hebrews reminds his, right, his listeners, there are times that you need to go back to the elementary things because he says, by this time, you ought to be teachers. But instead of you teaching, you need someone to teach you once again the elementary things, the basics. The basics, just read the Bible. B 
basics. Basics. And sometimes we think that just by being on a committee or coming to church and tithing and doing all those things, that's going to do it. It's going back to basics. Let's stand and then we'll ask our worship team to come and lead us in worship. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us over and over again about the basics. And thank you for keeping us alive one more day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your attention to our little things that we encounter in life here in Burns Lake. And we appreciate you involving in our lives. We thank you for what you're going to do as well. And we pray for the people that are ill and struggling, looking up to you for answers, for peace, for comfort, for strength, for courage. We pray for all those people listed in the bulletin that you would allow them to seek you, allow yourself to be found, and then help us to meet their basic needs. And thank you for looking after them for us. And now we pray that you would accept our worship and it's a token of our thanks for the things you do for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Oh, magnify, oh, magnify. Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever.
when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be <laughs> good singing Carson <laughs> such a powerful message in that song and just to recognize that the lives that we live have an impact on the future generations and and so uh, and uh, cause us to question what are the gifts that we are leaving behind uh, before I get into my sermon this morning I just wanted to add a word of thanks to a lot of you um, there's just been so many different people that have helped us in this whole process of moving into our new home. Uh, there's been people who have uh, brought things up to the house and helped us physically move from one location to another. There's been people who've picked things up for us in uh, Prince George. Um, just different ways, so many different ways that people have lent a helping hand and uh, we've just been very, very blessed uh, by you, the congregation, and so we just wanted to say thank you for that. This last few weeks, we've been looking at the implication of Christ's return. 
And the Bible tells us that our Lord's return is a watershed moment in the history of the world that will utterly transform the world as we know it. And we've looked at and we've talked about already the the fact that this will bring about the day of resurrection, a day when the dead in Christ will rise and their bodies that they receive will be like the bodies that the Lord Jesus Christ have. There will be a day of rewards, a day when the incomparable riches of our Lord Jesus Christ will be in full display as he crowns his people with the fullness of salvation. And then today we want to look at the fact that it will also be a day of reckoning. A day of reckoning. It's interesting in the, uh, uh, that story that uh, Reuben, <laughs> sometimes you get brain freezes up here. Uh, the, the story that Reuben told about the basics and he uh, pointed out that verse in, in Hebrews. Well, in Hebrews, one of the basic tenets of the faith that he says, these are the things that we need to remember. One is the resurrection and another is judgment, eternal judgment. And so that is uh, a thing that we want to look at today. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 13 says this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead and great and small standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in them, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. For many people, this whole thought of Judgment Day is something that that they would rather not think about. But the reality is, it is a core and a central uh, feature in the gospel message, in, in what we read in the Bible. And of course, there's much that we don't understand when it comes to judgments, when it comes to God's uh, wrath and hell and all of these things. And, and there's much, for that matter, that we don't understand about heaven either. But rather than focusing on the things that we really don't know for sure, what I want to do this morning is highlight three truths that I feel that the Bible is quite clear on concerning the Day of Judgment. So first of all, we can be confident that the Judgment Day is part of the good news of the Gospel. It's not something that we often think of it in that way, but it is a part of the good news of the gospel. You know, one of the big stumbling blocks that a lot of people struggle with, and you've probably encountered this, people who are considering Christianity, is that they question the wrath of God. They question God's judgment. How can a loving God condemn his creatures to hell? Can the Bible's teaching of judgment and hell fit with the good news of great joy that will be for all the people that the angels declared at uh, Jesus' birth? How do these two realities fit together? And, And let's face it, it's not just people who are wrestling with and skeptical of Christianity. It's it's you and I that wrestle with these questions as well. It just seems that this message of judgment is so out of step with our times. It just doesn't really fit with our culture. Our culture celebrates tolerance toward one another's different beliefs, different lifestyles, different choices. What you do, well, is up to you. That's your business. And what you believe is is fine, whatever you believe. If it works for you, good. Uh, Just as long as you're not hurting anyone else. That's the, the general attitude of culture. And then we read in the Bible that we are held to a standard, an absolute standard that is outside of ourselves and it just feels so out of step with, uh, with the culture. How are we to even communicate an idea like this to those around us? Sometimes I think, uh, I feel like I, I need to apologize for God's you know, wrath as if it were an unfortunate embarrassment that we would rather not talk about. But the message of judgment presented in the Bible is actually a central part of the good news. It's an essential part of the good news of the gospel. Let me explain why. 
The Bible's teaching, the Bible teaches that there is a day of reckoning, a day of judgments, a day in which evil will finally and fully, completely be dealt with. And that is good news. Have you ever felt a burning anger sort of well up within your heart, within your soul, when you hear stories of injustice, things that are happening in this world? You know, we read uh, or hear about stories of a child that's been molested by an adult who really should have been somebody that they could trust, a parent, a teacher, a pastor, uh, whoever, and it bothers us. It makes us angry. Or a cruel tyrant who lives in luxury and ease while his people are starving to death. Or human traffickers promising to you know, provide a job for this young girl in another country and so that she can send money back to her impoverished family when in fact they're just taking her off to another country to be sold as a sex slave. You know, these are stories that happen that we hear about all the time. And it's a sad, sad reality that's, that we live in. And sometimes it just makes you sick to the core. And you think, what is wrong with this world that we live in? I read a story about a Bible teacher in Africa who was teaching his class about the Lord's return from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The teacher read the verse that uh, Doris read just a moment ago in verse 16. For the Lord himself will, shall descend from heaven with a loud command. And immediately one of the students in the class put up her hand and said, Teacher, what will the Lord say? It says that he will come with a loud command. What will he say? Well, the teacher said, you know, nobody knows. The Bible doesn't say that. But then as he looked out on the class and he thought about all the hardships that his young students had already endured, uh, the war that they had been uh, surrounded by and, and the poverty that they live in. He, just, he thought uh, a moment and said, but if I were to guess, I would venture to guess that the Lord, when he comes down, will shout, enough, enough pain, enough war, enough death and sadness and tears, enough. The promise of God's judgment is God's guarantee that evil will finally and fully be dealt with and there will no longer be evil in this world. The wrath and the judgment of God is an essential part of God's love and his commitment to the new creation. It's part of the good news of the gospel story. There will be justice for all. Perhaps some of you have heard of Miroslav Wolf. He's a Croatian teacher and theologian. He's written some well-known books, and he's also uh, experienced firsthand the atrocities of the Balkan War uh, in Croatia and those areas. And, uh, and so he wrote a book about reconciliation. And in this book, he argues that the path, the only path to peace, the only path forward is to believe in divine judgment. Imagine, he says, lecturing a group of people whose cities and villages have been plundered and burned to the ground, whose daughters and sisters have been raped, whose sons and fathers have had their throats slit. Imagine that you were trying to convince these people to forgive and to be reconciled to their enemies because God's love doesn't judge anyone. Well, he says, that doesn't work. Not in that context. Maybe in a safe suburban neighborhood, people would accept a theology like that. But in the real world of pain and injustice, the only path forward, the only path toward peace and non-retaliation to end the cycle of violence is to believe that there is a God of justice who will bring about perfect justice in this world. And that's what the Apostle Paul argues as well in the book of Romans to believers who are facing persecution, who are facing all kinds of injustices. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21, Paul writes, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
How do we overcome evil with good? How do we give up our desire for justice, for revenge, and for vengeance? By remembering the good news of God's judgments. The day is coming will wrong, when wrongs will be put right, when there will be justice in this world. The judge will make things right. So it's a part of the good news. Secondly, we also can see from the Bible that judgment day is inescapable. It's inescapable. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, it says this. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among, the mount and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Kings, generals, the rich and the mighty, even the slaves and the free, will try to hide from the judgment of God. They will call on the rocks to hide them from the face of the Lord. But in the end, it says that it's all to no avail. Not, you know, your position in life doesn't shelter you from God's judgments, not even if you're a king. Generals can't use their power to escape his wrath. The rich can't buy their way out, and even the obscurity of poverty can't hide you from God. The judgment of God is inescapable. Now I can imagine that there are some people who would protest and say, well, we'll just, you know, now, wait a second. I can imagine, you know, the, the rapist, the murderer, the terrorists, uh, uh, the tyrant, all of these people. Yeah, yeah, bring on judgment. That's great. But that's not the people I know. The people I know are basically pretty good people. They're good neighbors. What about the civic, responsible, civic-minded neighbor who pays his bills on time and puts in an honest day's work? What about the soccer mom who faithfully drives her kids around to all their different activities and attends all the pack meetings and, and does as much as she can? Surely these upright unbelievers would escape the judgment of God. The problem of this way of thinking is that we're using the wrong standard for judgment. When I compare other people in the community, my friends and so on, I compare them to myself, then my unbelieving friends actually look quite good and probably a lot of them look a lot better than I do. But God doesn't mark on a curve. And I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but uh, there are some teachers, you know, who will take the average of the class and say, okay, well, you know, the class is struggling a little bit, so we'll, we'll lower the, the passing mark to uh, maybe 30% because everybody was not doing too well. And, uh, and so they, they take the average and they decide where the passing mark is accordingly. But God doesn't average out the goodness of humanity and say, well, so long as you're in the upper half or maybe the upper two thirds, then, uh, then you'll pass. Nor is God in heaven's keeping score. You know, we have this image in our mind of the Lord looking down and, and uh, keeping a tab on us and whoops, she lied, minus 50 points. <laughs> or, um, oh, look at that. He raked his neighbor's lawn. They didn't even ask, plus 100 points. You know, that's the way a lot of people imagine God. And, it, and maybe they think that's the way God should operate because they think that would be fair. But instead, what we read in the Bible is that God judges us, he measures us according to his glory, according to his righteousness. And when, you know, when we moved into our house, there was a lot of cleaning that we had to do. One of the jobs that I did was to clean windows. And so, you know, I would grab the little squirt bottle and, and uh, squirt down the window and wipe it with a cloth and try, dry it off with a paper toweling. And it, then I'd step back and I'd say, hey, that looks pretty good. And then a little while later on, the sun comes and catches the window and it shines on it and, and suddenly, you know, there's these streaks of water that I didn't quite catch and you know becomes visible or these fingerprints that I missed become noticeable it all gets exposed in the light and then uh, I love the sunshine but uh, I just don't want it to shine on windows because Ruth Ann will send me back out with a bucket of water 
The Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. And when the light of his righteousness, the light of his glory shines unto my life, there are things that others don't see that will be exposed. Things that maybe I don't see. I'm sure things that I don't see that will be exposed. John chapter 3, verse 19 to 20 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. On judgment day, there will be no hiding from the light of God's judgment. Our inner thoughts, unforgiveness, lusts, uh, hatred toward others, things that maybe your neighbor hasn't noticed, but the light of the glory of God will reveal. <clears throat> Our attitudes, inward attitudes, again, that people don't see, pride, judgment, selfishness, will be exposed. Actions that we told ourselves were okay because everybody else is doing it will suddenly not look okay. Or things that we failed to do because we convinced ourselves that it was somebody else's responsibility will have the light shone on it. People might think that their good moral living will exempt them from the judgment of God, but not so. In the end, everyone will have to face the reality that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, in Romans 3.23. And the day of the Lord, writes Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, is a day when earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. That is serious business. This is serious business. And it's why the Bible tells us about it, so that we can prepare for that day, so that we can turn to Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. Judgment Day is inescapable. And then thirdly, Judgment Day will be just. Judgment Day will be just. And I can say this with confidence for at least two reasons. The first reason is the cross of Christ. It's on the cross that we see, clearly see, just how seriously God takes sin. You know, if God was just going to say, ah, well, I'll just overlook it, then he wouldn't have had to send Jesus into this world to die on the cross. The cross tells us how seriously God takes sin, but at the same time, it also tells us how deeply he loves sinners. People wonder how the love of God and the wrath of God can coexist. I believe that the answer is found right there on the cross. Jesus came to offer his life as a sacrifice for our sins. You know, he even predicted his death and how he would die on the cross to his disciples before it happened. Though his disciples really had a hard time accepting it or believing it or understanding what he meant. And it's easy for us to imagine that for Jesus, you know, the Son of God, dying for us on the cross would be an easy thing. After all, he's, you know, he's always so calm and unflappable in whatever sorts of uh, difficult situation or storms he faces in life, even literal storms. <clears throat> but then, then we read about the story of in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's there in the garden that Jesus is confronted with what it's going to cost him, with what it's going to mean to drink from the cup of God's wrath. The cup of wrath was an expression that was used by the Old Testament prophets to describe all the stored up wrath and judgment of God against the accumulation of idolatry and treachery and violence and um, unfaithfulness of all humanity. This was the cup of wrath. And on, on the cross, Jesus drank this cup for us because he loves us. And there, you know, in the garden, he prayed, Lord, if there, Father, if there is a way for this cup to be taken from me, please, may it be, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was dealing with so much more than just physical pain. He was choosing to drink for us the cup of God's wrath. And so God is utterly holy and righteous. He doesn't ignore sin. He doesn't let it go unpunished. 
And he would be a no better judge than uh, some judge on our, you know, in our world who has a criminal in front of him and just gives him a little wink and says, ah, you know, just try to do better next time. We'll, we'll just let you go. We wouldn't think much of a judge like that. We wouldn't we'd say that's not just. But God is just, and he is also a loving and merciful judge. And so Jesus freely and willingly drank the cup of God's wrath for us so that we wouldn't have to. And so on the cross, sin is judged, and at the same time, forgiveness of the sinner is provided. What could be more just? What could be more fair than that? And so in light of the cross, we could never say, God, you're not being fair with me. He's gone all the way to the cross. He's done everything that he could. It's our part to receive the gift that he offered to all humanity. And so the cross shows us that judgment is, judged, is just. The second reason we can be confident that judgment day is just is simply rooted in the character and the nature of our judge himself. We can trust in the goodness and the wisdom of the one who will do the judging. This past week, I was reading in my devotions, uh, I've been reading through the book of Genesis, and I came to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story. And there's this part where Abraham is interceding for uh, Sodom, and, uh, and it's kind of this interesting interaction between the Lord and Abraham. It's like he, there's a bargaining that's going on. And in this exchange in Genesis 18, Abraham makes this statement. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Abraham knows the evil reputation of the people who are living in the valley. He knows that they deserve judgment. But at the same time, his nephew Lot is living among them. And so he's wanting, them, wanting God to be merciful. But he, has, uh, he feels torn, but ultimately he trusts himself to the infinite wisdom and the justice of God. Will not the judge of the earth do what is just? And we can do the same. There is much that we don't understand about judgment and hell. You know, scholars, even evangelical scholars today, wrestle with the question, is hell uh, eternal conscious uh, judgment or punishments that will go on forever? Or is it the total destruction, eternal destruction of the unbeliever, the annihilation of the unbeliever? Uh, what about the person who's never heard the chance or never had the chance to hear the gospel? Will they have a chance, the opportunity some way to be saved? What about um, children? who are young and are too young to understand the, the message of the cross, or people with mental disabilities and can't comprehend the message of the cross. What, what will happen to these people? And we have so many questions, and beyond all these questions, the, question, the issue of judgment is also very deeply personal, I think, to all of us. It's personal because we have loved ones and family members who are living uh, outside of Christ. We have loved ones who have died without Christ. And we wonder, Lord, how are you going to deal with these people? But while there is much that we don't understand, of this that we can be certain, the judge of all the earth will do what is right and just. He alone is able to untangle the frustrating mix of lies and truth, error and and good intentions, and ugliness, and beauty, and good, and evil, and all of the stuff that lies within each human heart, God will look and understand. And the good news is that the one who will judge us is also the one who gave his life for us. Who would you rather have as your judge? There is much that we don't know about Judgment Day, but I'm confident that at the end of our journey, we will meet a judge who is wise and holy and pure and loving. He will do what is right and just. At home, we, we have this old bathroom scale that uh, I think we've had for as long as we've been married. 
And you know, it, it will tell you a little bit differently. Uh, it will judge your weight differently depending on how you stand on it or maybe where you put, put it on the, the bathroom floor. And so uh, in the morning, sometimes we'll, we'll get up and we'll, we'll stand on it and uh, not too good, move it a little bit, stand on it again. And, and we'll just keep on moving it until finally it tells us uh, something that we want to see. And then, of course, there are times when maybe you have a big dinner or that extra dessert where you just don't stand on the scale at all. But ignoring something doesn't change the reality. Sometimes it's easier to, easy to treat difficult subjects in the Bible just by saying, well, you know, I'll only look at those verses that I would prefer to look at. Or maybe I'll just ignore it altogether. But ignoring something, again, doesn't change the reality. Let's not do that with the judgment of God. God's judgment is part of the good news of the gospel. It is the reason we can uh, love our enemies because we know that God is just and he will deal rightly with evil in this world. God's judgment is inescapable. Living good lives doesn't exempt us from the light of God's judgment, the light of his glory. Have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus? That's where our hope lies. Have you acknowledged that you are a sinner who falls short of the glory of God? And have you asked him to forgive your sins? You will either stand on judgment day before God with your own righteousness or, with the, or clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That decision is a decision that should not be put off. And then we know that God's judgments will be just and fair. The Lord Jesus offered to take the cup of God's wrath upon himself. What could be more fair than that? And in the end, we can trust the nature and the character, the wisdom and the goodness and the righteousness of our judge to do what is right. And at the end of time, God's children will join the great multitude of people that are pictured here in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 2, where it says, After this I heard what sounded like the great roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for your love that you went all the way to the cross. You took the cup of God's wrath on our behalf so that we could be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And I pray that if there is anyone here or anyone who is watching this service online uh, who has not made that choice to humble themselves before you and confess their sins before you, that, that they would do that because today is the day of salvation. Lord, uh, speak to their hearts. Speak to, your, speak to their hearts. And Father, we thank you for this great gift that we have received in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you will make all things right. You will put an end to evil and there will be a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation that is without death, that is without sin, that is without evil. Lord, we look forward to that day and may we live in the meantime with the fear of God and in the joy of the Lord. For we pray these things in the name of our Savior and just judge, Jesus Christ, amen. May the Lord bless you as you go from here. Thank you for coming.